Grace to you and peace on this Lord's Day, the last Sunday before October 31st. The day is important not because of the cultural games we may play on Halloween, All Hallows Eve, but because of it being the anniversary of the spark that ignited the wildfire we call the Reformation. On October 31st, Luther posted 95 topics for debate, offering to argue them with anyone who wished to enter a discussion. Those topics challenged mainstay beliefs and practices of the day. And that makes this Reformation Sunday. Often discussions of the Reformation focus on how events in Europe, on the continent, caused the followers of Martin Luther and John Calvin to split from the Roman Catholic Church, but insist that the Reformation in England was different. While this is partly true, I think a solid case can be made that though separated by the channel and by a few years, the Anglican Reformation really should be considered with the rest. There were political, theological, and scriptural dimensions in all parts of the Reformation. So I tend to think of church history, and even the history of Israel before, as a history of Reformation throughout. We don't really have time to flesh it out here today, but I wanted you to understand why I am offering the Reformation scriptures as well as the lectionary scriptures in this video today. As we begin, we pray. Holy Spirit, pour out upon us wisdom and understanding that, being taught by you and Holy Scripture, our hearts and minds may be open to receive all that leads to life and holiness. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. From Deuteronomy 34, we see that Moses' work was done when he had brought the people to the edge of the Promised Land. From Mount Nebo, Moses could see all of the Promised Land, and the Lord confirmed that this was indeed the land God had promised to grant to Abraham and his descendants. Moses died at the age of 120 in the land of Moab, still as vigorous as ever, and his sight was clear. Because it was the Lord who buried Moses, no one can show you the location. The nation grieved their loss, and the period of mourning was 30 days. Joshua, who was the son of Nun, was the one whom Moses had set apart to lead the people in his place. He was wise, and the nation obeyed him, continuing to follow the Lord's commands. No prophet since has been comparable to Moses. Moses was intimate with God, and through him God did powerful signs, unequaled before or since. Egypt and Israel both witnessed these powerful signs. Tradition has it that Psalm 90 was a song of Moses, a prayer for God to continue to show favor to the nation, remembering that God is eternal, while we are mortal. The alternate first lesson is from Leviticus 19 and is one of the passages remembering the commandments given by God, commonly called the Decalogue or the Ten Commandments. Within this passage, though, are additional commands. These commands concern practices related to offering holy sacrifices and also how people relate to the land and to the poor. For example, there's instruction to not fully harvest their crop all the way to the edges, nor harvest every grape from the vine, so that gleaners, whether poor foreigners or poor neighbors, might be able to eat also. Of particular interest to me today is the verse, You shall not stand idly by when the blood of your neighbor is at stake. This is directly related to the idea that failure to intervene when we can amounts to complicity in an evil being done. This passage concludes with a verse to which Jesus makes reference in the Gospel. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. It is a command that can be seen as a summary of most of this larger passage of Leviticus 19. The psalm response for Leviticus 19 is Psalm 1, and it affirms that the way of blessing and peace is to follow the instructions, the law, of the Lord. When we're careful to study it, and allow it to shape our lives, we become a blessing, like fruit trees. On the other hand, the way of the wicked ends in destruction. 
continuing to read from Paul's letter to the church at Thessaloniki, we are reminded this week, Paul reminds his friends of the circumstances of their meeting. Paul and his companions had been abused at Philippi, but undeterred by the opposition they had faced, they continued to proclaim the good news of God. And there was no subterfuge in the work that they did, no ulterior motives. God had entrusted a message to them, and so they shared that message in order to please God. Paul reminds them that they were not like some people, trying to use flattery to persuade them, nor trying to get rich from their work, nor trying to get the approval of any particular group. Now, while apostles should be paid for their work, the gospel was offered free of charge. No bills submitted afterward. Rather than door-to-door -door salesmen, it would be better to compare them to those who care for children. It's a love that has motivated Paul and his companions all along, and deep friendships have been formed, not just new converts and fresh disciples. The Gospel reading from the lectionary is from Matthew 22. Hearing how Jesus had bested the Sadducees in debate, the Pharisees decided they should give it a try. So they offered this as the topic for debate. Is there a command of God that's more important than all the others? Jesus affirmed that indeed there is one, and that is to love God with every fiber of your being. But he didn't stop there. He said, the list actually goes on. The second command in the list is to love one's neighbor. Love them as you would love your own soul. He offers his perspective that every other command in Scripture relates to one or the other of these two. Now, since he had a group of them together, he offered his own topic for debate. Who is father to the Messiah? They argued it was obvious the Messiah must be of the lineage of King David. So Jesus asked, Is the descendant greater than the ancestor? And he quotes Psalm 110, verse 1, asking, How would King David have called him Lord? In the verse it says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. How can King David have called one of his descendants, my Lord. No one could answer the riddle that Jesus had posed. And from that day, they decided they should not try to get into debates with him. Next, we turn to the texts that are related to Reformation Sunday. And there are a variety of texts suggested. There are two possible readings from the prophet Jeremiah. The first of those is an instruction to the people in exile that they should work and pray for the good of the community wherever they might live. The well-being, the shalom, the peace of the people of God will be directly tied to the shalom of their larger community. It's a passage that concludes with a promise of restoration to their homeland at some far future date. Now, the second possible reading from Jeremiah is a promise of a new covenant a time when all of the people of God will have the requirements of God as part of the deep fabric of their nature. The analogy is to be given a new heart. In this coming era, all sins will be forgiven, and everyone will know God. In response to the first lesson, either Psalm 130 or Psalm 46 might be used. The first is a plea for forgiveness and an affirmation that God is able to redeem. The second is an affirmation of faith that the people of God can trust God to shelter them even during tumultuous times, even when nations are violently at odds. God is with us. From the New Testament, from the letters, a variety of lessons are possible. Two of those lessons are from the Revelation. In Revelation 14, we find the promise that God will one day act to judge the evil of this world, and so, the messenger of the Lord summons all peoples from every land and language and nation, worship the Lord who created all things and who gives life. In Revelation 22, we find the promise of the eternal city where God makes God's home in our midst, and the river of the water of life flows from the throne of God, and the tree of life growing on the banks of the river 
bears year-round fruit, and medicine is made from its leaves. An alternative lesson is found in Romans 3, one of the great Reformation preaching texts for salvation by grace alone, through faith alone. For we hold that a person is justified by faith apart from works prescribed by the law. Another alternative lesson is from Paul's first letter to the church at Corinth. This is the passage that affirms the diversity of the church, that each person Christ calls has unique gifts and a unique role to fill in the church, and the church would be incomplete without them. This being the case, we should be diligent to care for one another in love. It seems to me that Blessed Be the Tie That Binds might be an appropriate hymn with its lines, Before our Father's throne, we pour our ardent prayers. Our fears, our hopes, our aims are one, our comforts and our cares. And for gospel texts, we have three possibilities. In John 8, we find the promise of Christ to deliver us, freeing us from slavery to sin. In John 15, we find the parable of Christ as the true vine. In this parable, Jesus asserts that God works in our lives to clean us, just as a vine dresser cleans the vine. The purpose of this cleansing work is so that we may become more fruitful. The alternative reading from Matthew 11 is the text where Jesus tells his opponents that there is no pleasing them. When John came, they didn't like his austerity, and now that Jesus is on the scene, they don't like his party going. The law and the prophets prepare the way, Jesus said, and if you can hear it, John was the voice of Elijah preparing the people for the coming of the Messiah. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Again, I invite you to pray with me. Lord, you have directed our paths, and you've warned us about wrong pursuits. But this love thing is hard. You've invited us to love you with everything we have, and instead we've fallen in love with our jobs, our houses, our electronic toys, and a bunch of other stuff. Loving you intimately is scary and we do often opt for another way. And you've invited us to live in loving relationship with everyone we encounter. But there are folk who are downright hard to love. We confess our inability to love as we should. We need your forgiveness and we need your help if we are to live as your people. Free us, we pray, to love as you do. Amen. Go in peace, do no harm, do good, and stay in love with God. And I hope to see you soon.